please stand by. It's this quick, there you go. We are streaming live right now, I believe. Yeah, we are live, perfect. Um, okay, so I think I will get started. Um, to our audience, honorable panelists and moderator, Assalamu Alaikum. I would like to wish everyone a very good morning, afternoon and evening. My name is Zahir Abbas and I am a member of Youth Policy Forum. We are a youth policy platform in Bangladesh with a vision to make youth integral to our country's policy process. We aspire to do so every day through creating sustainable policy reform through continued policy advocacy, education, research and collaboration with the next generation. Over the past four years, our work has spanned across Bangladesh's policy space. From organizing accessible online policy courses in Bengali involving Bangladeshi academics worldwide, to assembling a diverse grassroots network of passionate Bangladeshi students, to working directly with policymakers through our trademark governance apprenticeship program, we have worked very hard to make a spirited change across policy in our country. And we hope to make a great step in this direction through this newfound dialogue. It brings me great pleasure to introduce everyone to Youth Policy Forum's all new series, Forging Our Future. This is a milestone project for YPF, one that aims to bridge the public policy gap between Bangladesh and the world. Through this series, we aim to connect the great public policy luminaries of the world with brilliant Bangladeshi youth and policymakers. It is our ardent hope that we will create conversations that we can reflect on as our country, as our country continues to develop and grow years down the line. I'm very grateful to our team in YPF, many of whom are still working right now, and many of whom are watching the live, for working so fervently for this new initiative. I would also like to thank our media partners, the Business Standard, Boning Park, and Channel 24, for assisting us in promoting this initiative. And of course, I would like to thank our co-founder, Mohamed Abir Hassan, and Dr. Pauline Borma Collier, without whose visions this would not be possible. As we begin, uh, I would like to call some of the members of YPF, young, passionate Bangladeshi students, to share what they hope to learn from our panelists today. And I'd like to hand over uh, to Polly Madam. Uh, thank you, Zahir. Uh, would you like me to introduce the different um, uh, members of the, um, of the youth panel to voice their opinions first? Absolutely. Um, we have yes. with us um, Ena Mohamed Shubhai and Naima Nusad Arorapu, Momita Mallikapu, as well as Naima uh, Khanapu. Uh, sorry, I think I've done the introduction um, by your part, but um, yeah. So I guess um, our team members can go ahead. Um. Oh, yes, I have to prompt them to unmute. I will do that right away. Uh, would you like to uh, maybe uh, Momita Malik can start and we can proceed with the different people to um, we can voice their um, opinion about what they would like to emerge from this meeting. Momita, would you like to start? Yes, sure. Hello, everyone. I am Momita. I am the coordinator of the Economic Policy and Jobs Network at Youth Policy Forum. I would like to learn something from Dr. Mashir Rahman, sir. So as per our vision document, Bangladesh aims to become an upper middle income country by 2030 and an upper income country by 2041. However, I'm concerned that the pace of the reforms is slow to achieve the targets. I would like to know from Dr. Rahman sir whether the government of Bangladesh really has the capacity to implement the reforms that have been promised in our eighth uh, five-year plan and vision 2041. Uh, thank you. Uh, maybe Naima now, would you like to speak? Can't hear you, uh, Zahir. Uh, no, it's fine. Um, Apu, uh, feel free to unmute. I think there are some. Naima Apu? Yeah, go ahead. There you go. Thank you for this opportunity you to introduce myself first. My name is Naima Nusrat Aurora, and I'm an undergrad student of international relations in the University of Dhaka. So I have been working with the YPF grassroots team 
for quite some time and one of our main work is to interact with the people of remote areas and understand their challenges. Now it is quite evident that the economy of Bangladesh has grown but the fruits of economy, economic growth have not been enjoyed equally. So I'm really keen to understand how Sir Tim Baisley and other speakers think that state can in incentivize growth in the lagging regions. Also how local level state capacity can be improved for better public service delivery at sub-national and regional level. Thank you. Um, well, thank you, Naima. Can we go on to um, uh, the other Naima? Naima Khan, please. <laughs> Hello, greetings. I am Naima Nazmul Khan and I'm studying uh, economics at Brack University. I'm also leading the policy networks uh, with another our colleague. So I am uh, really, I really want to thank our panelists and everyone who joined the meeting uh, dialogue today. We, are, we look forward to an amazing um, uh, session today about everyone is keen to learn about the uh, topics and uh, the future of our state to, uh, specifically. So I would like to uh, 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 address the fact that while it's true that Bangladesh has done well in many uh, economic and social sector indicators, one area where we uh, have gone backwards is uh, democracy and institutions of accountability. Uh, I would like to understand how the quality of democracy impacts state capacity and development. So this is from me, and I would like to pass the floor to Enam Bhaiya. Uh, thank you, Naima. Um, this is Enam Ahmed Shuha. I am currently uh, working in policy forum and uh, coordinating the technology network um, of our team. And uh, currently I am living in Rajshri, which is the northern part of Bangladesh. So unlike the capital city Dhaka or the southern part of Bangladesh, um, Chitang especially. So my region is dependent mostly on agriculture rather than the industry. So I was uh, reading um, an article uh, written by Dr. Shanta Devarajan. Uh, that uh, a very recent article uh, titled Success Despite the Oars, South Sudan and Bangladesh. And uh, there he has mentioned that Bangladesh is not a paradox. It is a unique model of development. And in the same article, uh, Dr. Shanta has stated that Bangladesh industrial policy has been characterized by the supremacy of deals rather than rules and a fair amount of elite capture. I am uh, keen to understand from our panelists um, on this issue that how this deal making or the elite privileges could be a problem for Bangladesh as uh, we now envision to move from uh, the lower middle income to the upper middle income country. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, well, uh, thank you for all those comments and um, welcome to everyone. Um, I'm really honored and delighted to be moderating this inaugural panel discussion of the Youth Policy Forum. And um, as they here has already mentioned, uh, this first episode of the series it's, is envisaged really as an overarching introductory session, looking at state capacity and, and effectiveness in all its dimensions and how the role of the state might or perhaps might not be harnessed to help Bangladesh move from one phase of development to the next. And um, the economic game in Bangladesh um, is now clearly changing and it's seeking to move from lower middle to higher middle income status. And as it does so, the question is, uh, should the role of the state change accordingly? And if so, how and what can we learn from experiences elsewhere? So uh, to help us consider these issues and um, the issues uh, also raised uh, by various people who commented um, right at the beginning, um, it's my real pleasure to welcome today our very distinguished panel, who are Professor Sir Tim Besley, uh, Dr. Shanta Devarajan, and Dr. Mashur Rahman. Um, I'm just going to say a few words on each. Um, as you all know, Professor Besley is highly renowned in the field of economics and political science. 
and is one of the leading economists in restoring the study of political economy to prominence in mainstream economics. And he's particularly well known for his work on fragile states and on the different ways in which the state can be aligned with the interests of society. Uh, he is currently School Professor of Economics of Political Science and the W. Arthur Lewis Professor of Development Economics in the Department of Economics at the London School of Economics. Uh, and on the international level, um, Professor Besley has served as a consultant to the World Bank and to the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. And in June 2021, he was appointed to the World Bank International Monetary Fund High Level Advisory Group on Sustainable and Inclusive Recovery and Growth. Uh, our second speaker is uh, Dr. Shanta Devarajan, who is currently Professor of the Practice of Development at Georgetown University's Edmund Walsh School of Foreign Service. Uh, he previously had a highly successful career with the World Bank. He's been the Senior Director for Development Economics, as well as being a former Acting Chief Economist for, of the World Bank Group. Um, he's also served as um, Chief Economist of the World Bank Middle East, North Africa region and South Asia region. And as such, he is very familiar with Bangladesh and well known amongst our audience. Um, Dr. Devarajan's research covers many areas, including trade policy, natural resources and the environment, but he has a particular knowledge and reputation in analyzing the role of the public sector in development, which is, of course, going to be highly relevant to the discussion on this panel. Um, our third panelist is Dr. Mashur Rahman, whose name I believe everyone in the audience will be familiar with. Uh, Dr. Rahman is currently Economic Affairs Advisor to the Prime Minister of Bangladesh. I am the, the holder of a PhD. He studied at Dhaka University, Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy of Tufts University and uh, the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. Um, he's written extensively on a range of economic issues and is also a regular contributor of articles to newspapers and journals published in Dhaka. Uh, he's been a career civil servant, having held many important offices of government, including Secretary of the Internal Resource Division, Chairman of the National Board of Revenue, Secretary of Economic Relations and Secretary of Statistics, as well as Director General of the Bangladesh Bureau of Statistics. He's also been very active on the international front and having represented his government at the highest level at the Asian Development Bank, International Fund for Agricultural Development, Islamic Development Bank, and the World Bank. So now um, the session today is going to proceed as follows. Um, each of our panelists will speak for between 15 to 20 minutes each. We will start with uh, Professor Besley, followed by Dr. Davarajan, and finally by Dr. Rahman. After this, we will give each of our panelists a further five minutes to respond to or raise points in response to the presentation of their fellow panelists, if they wish. Then we will open up the discussion to questions from the audience, which the panelists will be invited to respond to. So now, without further ado, I would like to invite Professor Tim Besley to make his presentation, which is entitled State Capacity and Development. Professor Besley. Pauline, thank you. Thank you so much for that very nice introduction. And it's uh, intimidating to be here in multiple ways, not least because of the distinction of my fellow panelists. And uh, I was reflecting on the fact that I've known Shanta for well in excess of 30 years. You know you're getting old when you can say things like that. Um, and of course, when I first met him, he was at the Kennedy School. I noted that uh, Dr. Rahman, you mentioned, had studied there. So it's uh, all... all uh, joined in a certain in a certain way and, it's in, and and I was also humbled and slightly intimidated by the uh by the uh the, the um desires of the of the speakers for saying what they wanted to get out of this session given I'm I'm going to know my limitations I'm not an expert on Bangladesh and I'm not going to pretend to be so what I'm going to share with you today uh, and with with members of the forum is um uh, a, a little bit of an overview about some issues and a changing, I think, shift in the nature of the debate about the role of the state in development. 
that I at least hope is helpful in thinking through the challenges that Bangladesh faces. And my other uh, distinguished panelists will be able to, I think, pick up on themes that are much more directly related to the challenges that Bangladesh is, is currently facing and in a more contextual sense. So, so what I'm going to do, as I said, is to just give you a, a, an, an overview of, um, of, of, the, of the issues. Um, all of this is framed, I think, in the context of the, the development challenge, and, and Bangladesh, of course, faces that challenge. But to some extent, no uh, society or economy um, can, can uh, uh, fail to recognize that there are always challenges, things that one is trying to get right and to improve. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit only briefly about the pandemic at the end, but of course all societies across the globe have been challenged in different ways by, by, by events like that. And we're going to be challenged even more, and I, again I will briefly mention this at the end, by the challenge of combating climate change, which will again be a, a, a huge challenge to all societies. Um, but there's a long-standing debate, and this is where I just want to begin, on, on how to build an effective state and society to support development. Indeed, I would argue it's sort of one of the oldest questions in all of political economy. And here's a quote from Adam Smith in 1759, so more than 250 years ago, who made the following conjecture that little else is needed to carry the uh, state to the highest degree of opulence from the lowest degree of barbarism, but peace, easy taxes, and a tolerable administration of justice, all the rest being brought about by the natural course of things. Now, of course, if it was all that easy, why would we be holding a forum like this? Um, uh, the question is how one, one gets into this. But the way I read that quote and why I think it's still a defining challenge for the way we think is it says, get governance right and all else follows. Um, in, in a certain sense, mar the market is a universal. What, what isn't a universal when you go across the globe is really how government interacts with the market. And, this, and the central challenge in political economy in the field of political economy is understanding that interplay between markets and states. Um, I think the, the, the reason why the debate has changed, that there's sort of two stylized, very old fashioned ways of looking at this, neither of which I think is particularly helpful. One is to think of it as a, a, a sort of state versus market challenge. Where do we want the state to be and where do we want the market to be? I just don't think that's been very helpful in framing most of the, the issues that we, we care about. And the other is the, the, the rather, um, I think, unhelpful debate about de democracy and autocracy. I mean, of course, we have in an institutional framework, and I'm not claiming for one second that an institutional framework that we have in place isn't important. But I think trying to narrow that down to a debate like that is just not very helpful. So where I see that uh, the challenge and where I want to just give you a little bit of an overview today is on the issue of how we build state capacities. Um, which are the, and, and to understand the social, political, and economic underpinnings of that. So it's no longer, if you're going to study these issues, satisfactory to just be an economist. You have to get into issues of politics and even sociology, psychology, uh, anthropology. It's a very multidisciplinary uh, challenge. Um, and I think, so what are state capacities? State capacities are the sinews of the state, the things that make the state work. And um, although it's a simplistic um, uh, um, uh, division into different components of the state. I like to think of that in three parts. The fiscal state, how do you actually raise the revenues <coughs> excuse, excuse me, um, needed to support what the state does? How do you build a legal framework in which uh, the state and the market can operate? And how do we build the capacity to deliver collectively for those things that we need to, to provide for ourselves, education, healthcare, infrastructure, whatever that might be? Now, here's a sort of uh, a very stylized representation of this, and I, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but this is my attempt to summarize the work that I've done, mostly with uh, my uh, friend and colleague Torsten Persson at the University of Stockholm, on how we think about what, what drives state capacities and where state capacities sort of belong in a, in a kind of view about, um, about development. And um, the key thing that we, we have concluded, we have a book on this and we have several articles on this, is that the real challenge of the state is to build a sense of common purpose and common interest around the solution of the key problems. That... Did I get mute? Yeah, sorry, I, that was am I, multiple issue. Am I muted or unmuted? No, we can hear you now. Okay, hear me. Okay. 
um, that we, we to, to build the common interests that support the attempt to engage in collective action. And that's a non-trivial thing to do. And how do we do it? We do it by trying to build institutions that bring people together to sort out the problems and to identify those collective interests. But norms and values and cultural factors are also important. If we, if we focus on those common interests and what it is we want to achieve, in order to get there, we need to have a capable state that's going to deliver. So the first step is to recognize the challenge and to recognize the problem. So think about climate change as a contemporary example. We need to decide that we're going to fight that problem and we have a particular approach to it. We then need to think about what a capable state, uh, what kind of capable state is needed. That will then allow us to have effective economic policies and the thing that we ultimately care about, I'll, I'll classify as peace and prosperity, but we can have our own different um, perspectives on the, on, the, on the ultimate goals of life, but, but they're gonna be something around that. So that's kind of a stylized way of thinking about it. So where state capacities fit in is um, in sort of prior to economic policy, because you can't advocate a policy that the state can't deliver. If you do that, you'll just create disappointment. And similarly, you can't build state capacities unless there's a clear agreement on what it is you want the state to do. So it fits between common interests and economic policy, in my view. Okay, I'm oh, sorry, I skipped that. Um, so of a fashion, and I'm not really gonna spend much time on this because it's probably not essential, you can kind of try to measure where are different countries in terms of their fiscal, collective and legal capacities. The one thing you observe when you try to do that, and I'll very quickly go through some uh, three, three slides to illustrate this, um, is that there's a very strong positive correlation. There's very few states in the world that have a strong legal system, but not a strong fiscal system, and are not capable of providing the kind of uh, um, core public goods and services that people want. So there's a strong correlate, and it's a strong correlate with economic development. Now, correlation does not imply causation, of course, but I would argue that, 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 that here, the process of economic development is part and parcel of the process of building state capacities. Um, a, a second fact is that avoiding internal conflict, especially civil, especially civil war, has been an important part of effective state building. And how you build the institutions, norms, and values that enable you to do that is, is a critical part of the whole story. A third uh, um, component of this is that when we think about state fragility, that weak state capacity is not everything to say about state fragility, but it's a key correlate of state fragility. And the, and the fourth thing is to note that patterns in the data are highly persistent. Now that's a huge challenge to us if we want to change the world, and many of us do, but we have to recognize that over longer, longish periods of history, progress is often slow and very challenging. So let me just quickly show you this. So we have measures of, of collective capacity through the, these are measures based on the capacity of the state to provide healthcare and education, roughly speaking. We have, and that's on the horizontal axis, our collective capacity index. Uh, the tax share in GDP is a very simple way of thinking about um, fiscal capacity. And then we have an index of the um, protection of property rights as a crude measure of legal capacity. Now, of course we could, enrich this picture a lot. The thing I want you to observe is we colored the dots. Um, the red dots are the high income countries in the world, the hollow dots are the middle income countries, and the blue dots are the low income countries. And to some extent, this is the research program that I've been engaged in for more than uh, 10 years now with Torsten, trying to understand all of this. What drives all of these patterns that you're seeing here? One thing I'll draw your attention to is there's a kind of collection of red dots in the top right-hand box, which comes out all the time. They are the countries that are generally peaceful, have strong institutions, norms and cultures to, to supporting um, uh, collective wants. So a kind of archetypal example in these red dots is a place like Denmark or Sweden, um, a country that appears to be doing incredibly well across a range of indicators. But they're also providing strong support for markets, not just strong support for the state, but strong support for markets. So there's no state versus markets. It's a state and market story. The middle income countries fan out quite a bit as do the low income countries, but the pattern lines up as we don't, might expect that the strong state capacities tend to correlate quite well with income, but there's a lot to explain here. There's a lot of, these are data clouds, not data points in sense. 
and, and it's explaining the differences across countries, which is interesting and challenging. We sometimes use the first line, perhaps overuse the first line of the uh, novel by Tolstoy of Anna Karenina, um, where if you recall, the opening line says, all happy families are alike, all unhappy families are unhappy in their own way. Um, I probably misquoted slightly there. But the notice there's a quite, a, these are the happy families in the world. These are the states that many people look up to for levels of social provisioning and effective market performance. But once you get to the states that are not up there, there's quite a fanning out. The, the unhappy families, if you want to think of them uh, in that way, are, are quite a varied bunch. The story of conflict is a bit more mixed, but you do tend to get that conflict, um, so whether you've had civil war or not, is, is something of a correlate with uh, state capacities. And then also fragility and, state and low state capacity tend to go together, which was my third claim. The persistence is if you draw a picture of uh, we have we've created something called the pillars of prosperity index, which is a kind of index of state capacities and a few other things income and peace. And what you tend to find and won't surprise you is when you look around the world, um, you, there's, a, there's a kind of predictable geography of state capacity. So in Africa, in particular, state capacity is lower than in other, any other continent of the world, um, although you get low state capacity countries even um, within um, uh, other, other, other geographies. But the, the reason I'm showing you this is not so much to look at the spatial pattern, but more to look at the temporal pattern. So I'm going to show you this is our Pillars of Prosperity Index for 2006, and this is our index for 2016. And the point I'm going to take over that 10 years, and you know, the extent we've been able to do this over even longer periods, the geography is not changing very much. Most of the, and in, in fact, I think if I could do this over 100 years, Although within countries there's been a lot of change, the distribution of capacities across countries probably hasn't changed even a whole lot in even over longer periods. Okay, um, so let me bring it down to something contemporary just to sort of conclude on, um, uh, uh, and that's to talk about state capacities in the pandemic. And I'm actually part of a, a project um, called Periscope. Don't ask me what that stands for. It's an acronym for a European-wide project on looking at how states have dealt with the pandemic and thinking about how state capacity has played a role in fighting the pandemic. But if you think about it, all three kinds of state capacity I've been talking about, the ability to raise money, to support people's incomes, to spend on health care, all of these things, the role of the tax system has been very important. The legal system has also been important as we've tried to persuade people to change their behavior to affect the transmission of uh, COVID. And um, uh, similarly, collective capacity, the ability to deliver health care, vaccinations, and all other things have been absolutely central. So I would argue in the pandemic, it does shine a spotlight on, um, on state capacity. Equally, as, as I say, going forward, I think this is doubly true of uh, climate change. If we are going to fight seriously climate change, we're going to need public resources to make the investments we need. We're going to need a legal system that compels people who are not willing to comply with the, with the dictates that are going to be needed to really combat climate change. So legal capacity is important and equally collective capacity delivering on the kinds of infrastructure needs that will make a big difference or could potentially make a big difference. Okay, um, so very quickly to, 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 to end up on, um, uh, did ask the question, did countries with greater state capacity also fare better in keeping mortality low during the, um, during the pandemic? Uh, it's a little early to tell. I mean, we're still I, hopefully towards the end of the pandemic, but certainly uh, still it's not over. And uh, I'll just show you uh, a couple of things just to sort of um, hint at, at what the answer is. What this gives is the distribution of, the ex of excess mortality by country comparing countries with high state capacity, which is the blue uh, distribution, and countries with low state capacity, which is the red distribution. And what you'll notice is while the distributions overlap, um, the, on the whole, it's the, it's the high state capacity countries that have done best at keeping mortality lower during the pandemic. And there's this large tail of low state capacity countries that have generally done poorly during the pandemic. So, it, it, it's really a focal of an, a, another way of reminding ourselves on the importance of state capacities in this very specific context. And then if you look across countries, 
Peru is a very strange outlier here, by the way. Um, there's another story here, and I haven't had time to go into about the role of inequality in, in state capacity. That's a whole different dimension of this that I haven't gone into, which I think does tell me something, tell us something about what's going on here. Anyway, the bottom line is if you look across countries, and I've just used the fiscal capacity here, that countries that have generally had high, have higher fiscal capacity have done um, have, have generally had lower excess mortality compared to other countries. So there is a, a hint that um, uh, state capacity has played a role. So what have I tried to argue here? And what have I tried to tee up as a kind of topic for conversation? It's that the challenge is how we build capacities of different kinds. It's a multidimensional challenge. It's not just if we get one thing right or another thing right, it's getting that interdependent system right, which involves um, fiscal, legal, and, and uh, collective capacity. And, and I hope that's what we'll get into in the discussion. It may be even things that my discussants pick up on. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll leave it uh, for now. And uh, I'd be very interested to hear what you have to all have to say, but especially members of the panel. Thank you. Um, thank you very much indeed. Uh, that was very clear and very illuminating. And um, it's provided a very useful context actually in which to consider Bangladesh's uh, specific situation. Um, now, uh, could I invite Dr. Devarajan um, to uh, make his presentation? Uh, the title is Bangladesh is not a paradox. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pauline. Uh, and let me just say, it's a real pleasure to, to be here. Uh, uh, I, I, I confess that, you know, just like you're not supposed to have uh, favorites among your children. Uh, when I was chief economist of the South Asia region, uh, I'm supposed to have eight countries that treat them all equally. But I had a really special place in my heart for Bangladesh. It was my favorite country to work on. And I always enjoyed thinking about Bangladesh. Um, and uh, so I really appreciate this opportunity uh, and also to, to engage with uh, my friend Tim from 30 years uh, again uh, and also learn from the, the young people who, who posed some very challenging questions at the beginning. Um, what I'm going to talk about is uh, almost a, 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 an apology for, <laughs> for having said something maybe about 20 years ago and written something which other people have picked up on, that Bangladesh is a paradox. Um, and the paradox was quite simply that Bangladesh has had a growth rate that has been accelerating by one percentage point a year for every decade of since independence. And now it's up to six, 7% uh, a, a year. And at the same time, during that same period, Bangladesh was one of the most corrupt countries in the world. They were at the top of the Transparency International Corruption Index for about a decade in the, in the 2000s. And now they're not in the top, but uh, 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 quite high. And for those of us, and you know, we, we heard from Tim just now about state capacity and those of us who believe that corruption is a drag on, on growth, uh, this comes across as a paradox. How is it that while corruption seems to debilitate growth in so many other countries, in Bangladesh, it seems to be that uh, they're, they're growing despite this very uh, high levels of corruption. Now, uh, and you know, people like uh, Wahiduddin Mahmood and others have, have uh, written about this and trying to explain it. But let me first say that, in fact, if you look a little bit more closely in, uh, in Bangladesh, there are actually five paradoxes around the country. One of them is this, uh, is this discrepancy between high corruption uh, or the, this uh, uh, association of high corruption with uh, high growth. But you also look at the uh, enormous success that Bangladesh has had in terms of human development, health and education indicators have been progressing and life expectancy has been rising quite, uh, quite rapidly. And most of that is uh, delivered by the non-state sector. You know, secondary education in Bangladesh is provided by the non-state sector almost exclusively. 
Um, and there's quite a lot of primary school, uh, primary education that deliver, that's delivered by NGOs like BRAC. Uh, somebody mentioned BRAC University, but it's also BRAC schools. Uh, and let me just tell you one anecdote from BRAC, which is that uh, uh, when uh, Francois Bourguignon, who some of you know, and I were in Bangladesh at one point uh, when Francois was chief economist of the bank, and we visited a BRAC school, a primary school, and Francois introduced himself and said, oh, hi, I'm, I'm Francois, I'm from France. And immediately one of the students, one of the primary school students puts their hand up and says, how many BRAC schools are there in France? <laughs> and uh, of course the, the answer was zero, but it was an interesting point that for, for them, that was, you would expect there to be BRAC schools in, in uh, a country like France, even if there, there, there weren't. Uh, the third paradox, and this was mentioned earlier by, by uh, Iman, I think, uh, which is that Bangladesh is a country where the industrial sector uh, or the, pri the, the private sector seems to be operating on a set of deals rather than rules. Um, you know, people you know and the people who are connected are the ones who get most of the, the, the benefit. And again, usually this is, is a, an impediment to uh, growing an export-led uh, industry. And yet Bangladesh has this incredibly successful uh, ready-made garment industry. Um, it's, it's the world's second largest producer of, of ready-made uh, garments, and it's a, it, it employs about 4 million people and has been growing by leaps and bounds uh, uh, over the last uh, two, two decades. So another paradox, you've got a lot of uh, elite capture and yet, unlike other countries, they've had a, a great growth. The fourth paradox, and this is actually is something I, I, I don't think it's noticed uh, enough, is that Bangladesh has a very low tax to GDP ratio. Uh, it's about 9%. It's one of the lowest in the world uh, in terms of tax revenue uh, collected. And yet, and, and usually countries that have very low levels of tax revenues suffer all sorts of macroeconomic instability because there isn't enough revenue. And so the governments run high fiscal deficits and so on. Um, and I might add that my own country, Sri Lanka, is in that category. But in Bangladesh, they've had macroeconomic stability throughout their career, throughout the history since independence. So you have pristine macroeconomic stability, very low fiscal deficits, at the same time, very weak tax collection. And finally, uh, the, the fifth paradox that a lot of people talk about uh, is that the banking sector uh, is highly uh, fragile, if you like, uh, with uh, lots of non-performing loans, probably given to political cronies and things like that. Uh, uh, and you know, several banks like Shonali Bank, uh, I remember, uh, is always uh, teetering on the brink because they have uh, uh, such, a, such a poor uh, balance sheet. And at the same time, this is the country that gave microfinance to the world. Grameen Bank uh, developed microfinance and it grew and it's now exported around the world as a uh, method of, of finance, especially for poor people. So again, a paradox, you, the, the, the banking system doesn't seem to be working and yet The question really comes down to, uh, can we explain these seeming paradoxes? Um, and uh, let me suggest that, that there, there is something unique about Bangladesh, a couple of things unique about Bangladesh that might help explain these. Uh, the, and the, the point is that it, they have to do with geography and history. The geography is that Bangladesh is one of the most densely populated countries in the world. In fact, it is the most densely populated country of countries above a certain uh, population threshold. And it's a relatively homogeneous population. So you've got a dense pack of people and they're all quite similar. They speak the same language, they're more or less the same religion, uh, same cultural uh, uh, heritage which is, by the way, very different from, say, an African country like Nigeria, which is, which is much more diverse and much more sparsely populated. 
And what this means is that when you've got this densely populated, popula densely populated country with homogeneous population, what it means is that ideas spread like wildfire across the country. So a bunch of NGOs introduced contraception in the 1970s, and before you knew it, the whole country was practicing family planning. That idea just spread as rapidly as, it, as, as, as you can think uh, in, 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 in the country. And it, it's the same thing with the, the, the non-state provision, if you like, uh, uh, of uh, health and education. You know, Bangladesh was coming off of a liberation war and the place was devastated uh, and, and in chaos. And some NGOs started, knew that you had to deliver health services. And so they started delivering health services uh, 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 around the country and, and also uh, education. And before you knew it, they were doing very well uh, on health and education. So by the time the government got its act together to, to form a government, these the, the, the non-state providers had already taken off. And the government took the decision, well, if they're doing so well, let them continue to do it. And that's how you end up now with uh, a secondary education with uh, a, 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 a almost 100% uh, privately uh, provided. Uh, it's the same thing with the, with the ready-made garment sector. You know, the, the Bangladesh had a very protective trade regime and they decided they would allow these bonded warehouses so people could get some, some inputs, actually it was just yarn uh, duty-free into the country. But you open up a few bonded warehouses, all of a sudden everybody has access to cheap yarn and they start producing garments uh, with it and exporting it uh, uh, to, the, to the rest of the world and creating employment. So even though there were all these deals, which actually led to the highly protected sector, you open it up one little bit with the bonded warehouses and you get a huge uh, growth in the uh, export sector. Uh, and, and the microfinance, the, the growth and success of the microfinance, I, let me speculate on this, but I think there's some evidence, it grew before the government could get its act together to regulate it. Um, and so again, it was growing organically in a way that, uh, uh, it, it, that, that, that you, couldn't, uh, you couldn't stop it and it became very successful. And the reason I say that is because you compare the performance of microfinance across the border in India, where in India, when they started microfinance, immediately the Reserve Bank of India decided they were gonna regulate it. And it remains still very small uh, uh, in, a, in a country like India, even though the need is probably just as, just as high. And then another feature of Bangladesh's growth, uh, uh, another feature of Bangladesh's growth is, 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 has been the remittances. You know, uh, the, uh, all of you are probably sending, or those of you outside the country are probably sending money uh, uh, to the country, but this, this is a major feature. And the, the, the characteristic of remittances is that it's private to private transactions, right? It's private individuals living abroad, sending money to their families, uh, living in uh, in Bangladesh again, the, the, they 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 work uh, uh, around the government, and this the, again is another case of of ideas spreading quickly. I mean, you have one or two people from Silet going to the Gulf, and the next thing you know, the whole village, uh, whole villages are uh, have uh, have migrant workers in the Gulf uh, and sending uh, uh, millions of dollars uh, of of remittances. And I just want to give you another. Uh, Anecdote, Saifu Rahman was the finance minister when I was uh, chief economist for South Asia, and we got along really well. And so he, uh, I would take him to lunch whenever he came to Washington uh, at a very nice Indian restaurant, uh, Bombay Club. And one day we were sitting there at lunch and the waiter came by and he noticed that the waiter had an accent that was from, showed that he was from Select which is his, uh, his constituency, his hometown. And the next thing you know, you know Saifur Rahman is missing because he's in the kitchen uh, uh, politicking with all of the, 
Bangladeshi waiters and, and cooks uh, that, that are populating the entire kitchen of Bom Bombay Club uh, because he didn't want to miss the opportunity to, to uh, get, get a few more votes uh, from, uh, from Select. That's, that's the, 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 the spread of uh, migrant workers and, uh, uh, and, and uh, the, uh, the remittances that we, we get. And then finally, on the, the low tax to GDP ratio, uh, let me suggest that I think that's a, that, that, that's a conscious decision by the government um, to avoid macroeconomic instability, uh, both for its own sake, but also because once you get into uh, uh, difficulties with the macroeconomy, you invite the IMF to come in and start dictating what you do. And I think the Bangladeshis are very proud of the fact that, that the, the economic policy has been very much driven by people within the country. And this is one way in which you can actually maintain uh, your, your independence is to say, make sure you're impeccable on the macroeconomic front, regardless of what the, the tax to GDP ratio uh, 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 is. And the reason I say this is because uh, Zaidi Sattar and I wrote a paper maybe about 10, 12 years ago, um, where we try to understand the same thing about trade policy in Bangladesh. Because you know, Bangladesh in many ways is, is a textbook example of the success of trade liberalization. Uh, when they opened up the economy, when they opened up trade, the economy boomed. Uh, every, every time you can see that. And you know, the example I gave with the bonded warehouses is one example. And yet the rhetoric in Bangladesh constantly and I think it's still there, is always that trade liberalization is something bad, um, something uh, we, should, we should try to avoid, or we should keep some protection uh, and, and introduce some kind of uh, industrial policy. And we were trying to understand what, how, how you can match these two. In fact, we call the paper Rhetoric versus Reality in Trade Policy in Bangladesh. And one of our explanations is that you have to keep that rhetoric going in the country. Otherwise, it would seem like the trade policy is also something dictated from abroad, particularly by the World Bank and IMF. Uh, uh, so if, if you keep the, the rhetoric that we, we don't do trade policy, but you know, on the side, we actually do open up trade, we are actually getting the benefits without you losing that, that independence. So the, the bottom line is if, if, you, if you look at, if you, if you uh, buy my interpretation of these paradoxes, there really isn't a paradox. Uh, the, 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 or the paradox is really in our own thinking, which is that we typically expect government to support good development. And, and Tim, uh, Tim alluded to this in his remarks as well that we want to get government to help people develop. The, but the, the fact is that in Bangladesh, the government is, is so dysfunctional that the people have figured out a way to go about development despite the government. They go, they go around the government and get on with the, sh with the show with development. And in fact, they're succeeding. So you see the growth, the employment, the, the uh, uh, health and uh, education indicators uh, are, uh, and the macroeconomic stability uh, is, is maintained, even though there's high levels of corruption and deals and stealing going, going on. Now, they're helped by the fact, as I mentioned earlier, about geography and history. Uh, but nevertheless, it is the, the, the hard work and spirit of the Bangladeshi people who are able to succeed despite the odds, despite the fact that government is uh, uh, is, is corrupt. So th th this is not a paradox. This is just a different model of development. Um, it's Bangladesh's unique model of development and it's, happen it's, it's, it's uh, su succeeding. And so I think it's time we, we appreciate it that th 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 there are many varieties of this relationship between government and, uh, and, and development or governance and development. And this is one particular case, which is uh, the, the Bangladeshi case, where people are uh, succeeding in development and will continue to succeed uh, despite the government, even if we cannot get government to perform better.
let me stop there and uh, we can come get back to some questions about the future uh, in, the, in the discussion. Thank you very much. So apologies, I'm having trouble with my <laughs> video. Um, okay, sorry, Shanta, I've had problems with my video. Um, thank you very much indeed. I think that's going to, um, uh, I, I'm very interested to see what Dr. Rahman has to say in response to your presentation. I mean, one could almost deduce that um, Less government is better in certain circumstances, but um, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Rahman to um, uh, to make his presentation. Dr. Rahman, thank you. Uh, uh, I do appreciate the, uh, the appreciation and the qualified appreciation from Dr. Shantarajan. But let me say that um, I have a feeling that. Uh, I kind of, there's, a, there's an inadequate understanding of uh, the independence and the spirit of independent, independence. The basic premise of the independence movement was that if transfer of resources are reversed and if Bangladeshis acquire the right of self-rule, the prosperity would happen. And because of that crucial point is not uh, always recognized, there's a pessimism, some kind of skepticism. Okay, this was not supposed to happen, but this has happened. Why did this happen? So that comes as a paradox in uh, 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 Dr. Shantadev Rajan's uh, presentation. Uh, I tried to take a look at uh, the kind of policies and changes that had been introduced since independence. First is uh, we have this uh, limit on individual or family ownership of land. If you do that, then there is automatically a restraint on how much of wealth accumulation can happen uh, based on uh, land, property, and agriculture. If, if, if someone depends on uh, land only for accumulation, he can only appropriate someone else's land either by legitimate transfer or by some other means, but the overall supply of land does not increase. So the people who wanted to do something or to do well in economic terms, they had to turn to uh, business and industry. And they had a chance of uh, development after independence, which were not available to them earlier. But while talking of land, I guess I should also mention that if you look at what has been happening to agriculture and land, you find that the area available for cultivation has been decreasing. But at the same time, the agriculture crop growth has kept pace with the population growth. And it still is above the population growth, is about three, four percent. So what we did was uh, uh, intensity of cultivation and also use of uh, scientific knowledge, irrigation, fertilizer, and so on. I have a slightly different view about uh, this primary education. I would not say that the NGOs have not done something, but the NGOs, uh, for instance, the Brax schools are located in particular areas. And if you look at the whole country, it is the private primary schools which have, which have uh, uh, serve the, the, the need for primary education. Our, uh, many of these primary school salary was uh, paid by the government and primary school has now been virtually nationalized, taken over by the, by the government. There are some primary school in the private sector, uh, but that number is very few. Secondary school, originally these were all privately run but at some point of time, many of them were taken over by the government. And right now, the program is, I mean, right now the government's intervention is in terms of subvention of teacher salary for the 
largest number of secondary schools. There are also new schools being set up by the government. Some of the old existing schools are being taken over by the government. So it seems to me that the information about the non-government or non-state sectors contribution to primary and secondary education is a little blurred, or maybe it is because of my exposure to a different kind of experience or different kind of uh, arrangement. Public university is another thing. Uh, we started with two or, two, two or three public universities, uh, four public universities, but now we have a public university virtually in each old district headquarters. And there are a few uh, in uh, other areas also. Private university is a new innovation and the government has allowed private universities to be set up. These are mostly in Dhaka. They teach mostly businesses, business administration courses. There is a little bit of professional education like architecture and law and a very little bit of computer science and so on. But that has expanded the supply of education definitely. Technical and vocational education, uh, that was neglected. But right now, the government is expanding vocational training at the secondary level and at the post-secondary level, there is a technical school and college being set up. Now, as to the women's empowerment, I guess Bangladesh is one of the pioneers in that area. And particularly if you take into account the developing countries as Bangladesh was. Now, the quota for employment of women in government or public sector was fixed in 1972, but it took some time for uh, more meaningful implementation. Uh, not known to many is the fact that we have a major general who's a woman. I mean, there are not many countries where you would find a woman being a major general. She's of course in the army, education, army uh, medical corps. Family planning was emphasized beginning from 1970. And aided by these policies uh, addressing particularly women, this has proved success. I, I do accept the book. I do recognize the contribution made by NGOs, but the government had been working on the family planning from the very beginning of independence and uh, the NGOs uh, uh, did join in. Ready-made garments is uh, a genuine case of private sector's contribution uh, subject to the facilities that was provided by the government's rule. Now, so bonded warehouse that definitely helped uh, the export industry, the garments particularly. Uh, but before that, uh, we had a practice of allowing bonded facilities to some domestic industries also. These industries, there were very few which had, uh, which had the which had the privilege of having a bonded warehouse, and uh, those producing for the domestic product, domestic consumption, they would pay the taxes after at the time when the goods were taken out of the bonded warehouses. But it was expanded. Bonded warehouse made their contribution only in relation to garments industry. Uh, our export is dependent on garments, 85% or so are garments, ready-made garments. But right now there's a slight, uh, I mean, the entrepreneurs have shifted to uh, the uh, uh, household, household electronic appliances, uh, but the production is still very limited. There was a reference to remittance that has been a very important thing. And uh, during the pandemic, uh, we didn't send too many people abroad for as worker, but as the, uh, as the workers accepting countries improve in their economic performance, I believe uh, we would start sending more and more people. Now in the 1980s and through some period of 1990s, there was a, uh, there was quite a few reforms which were undertaken. These were banking reforms, tariff reforms, introduction of VAT, budgetary reforms, liberalization of foreign exchange, but with certain limitations and so on. Together, I would argue 
that they uh, they lay ground for a more competitive economy and gave export orientation uh, orientation to export but in addition to that i would suggest that we take a look at uh, its uh, revenue implications the revenue implication was uh, that in one go because of the introduction of vat and some uh, custom duty reforms uh, there was a one time increase of about 4% of gdp to about 6% in uh, uh, early 90s and since then uh, the, the the growth has not been very significant uh, it is uh, it's roughly stuck at uh, 9 to 10 percent of, of of gdp it is pretty low but to explain the paradox that uh, <clears throat> shantar shantar abrajan raised that uh, the the revenue collection is low but uh, there is not excess deficit expenditure either. I guess there are two things which may have to take into account. One is uh, the you raise more revenue in order to finance a large budget or large expenditure. If you look at our expenditure, you'll find that the budget may start with a large number, but by the time you take a stock of what has actually been spent, you find that actual expenditure about 15% uh, lower than, than, than the budgeted expenditure. So what we, I mean, what we do not collect, we do not spend. If you look at the trend, you will find that the government's policy, fiscal policy uh, has been consistently, I would say cautious and maybe conservative, but it was also accountable. The deficit was con contained at about four, four and a half percent, half of which was financed by uh, external resources, mostly aid, and half of which was domestic resources. So the domestic resource use was so small that <clears throat> I'm inclined to believe that didn't have any crowding out effect. On the contrary, investment in infrastructure facilitated uh, private investment, made private investment more uh, more 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 uh, attractive now there was a reference to the banking sector's supply npl has been increasing and it seems that it it could not be tamed but if you go back a bit in history what do you find uh, the banks were nationalized after independence in 1971 after 1975 the private sector and the private enterprises were allowed to grow and they borrowed heavily from the banks. The, the, the policy of giving loan for industrial development at that time was the government fixed a target of investment, distributed it sector-wise and allocated the distribution of that amount to the different banks. So that was the time when we piled up a huge NPL. But after 90s, after 1980s uh, banking sector reform, there was an effort to bring down the NPL, but as I said, it, it keeps on coming. One of the reasons could be that access to loan and access to low cost credit uh, encouraged investors to choose uh, sectors and investments which were not really competitive and the loan get stuck up there. I, I, uh, I most of it do not uh, say that uh, the borrowers are at default. I, I tend to say that there is something flawed in the process of intermediation. That would hold the fellow who approves the loan as accountable as the fellow who borrows and cannot repay the loan. So intermediation process has to improve in order to improve the quality of lending. If you look at our investment and, and, uh, and savings, you find that our saving is about 29, 30% over a five or 10 years period. Our investment also matches that. And within that, there is about four and a half percent of deficit financing, as I said, half of which is uh, uh, financed by, by concessional uh, loan. On poverty, we have done pretty well, but not as well as, as we should have. 
uh, it was uh, 20%. I mean, the upper level poverty was 20%, and the extreme poverty was reduced to 14%. During <coughs> pandemic, uh, the poverty is, is estimated to have gone up a bit. But the government has taken up the safety uh, net program to help those people. Now, there's one thing that I guess we should take into consideration. If you go to the villages, you will find that the income, income of households are not recorded. But how do you know that someone is poor and someone is not poor? A lot of it depends from the, the, the information that you get from the, the key informants, the neighborhood people in that area. So identifying the fellow who deserves uh, uh, government assistance correctly is a complex task and uh, the popular judgment of who is poor and who is not poor also uh, goes into that. Uh, I missed some point. Okay, I mean, let me uh, pick up some of the uh, uh, points which have been raised by uh, Santa Debras. One is uh, corruption index. I hesitate a little to uh, to talk about the corruption index. Uh, I, in my capacity, in in the charge of my official responsibility, I had to look at it only on two occasions. Uh, I remember reading in the technical notes uh, that accompany that number, that cautions people th that uh, not to take the scores too seriously because these are translation into numbers of some subjective judgment. Secondly, it also pointed out that some of the countries which, are, which may be more corrupt are left out because there is not enough data on them. And uh, uh, there was another occasion when I looked at uh, this, uh, oh, this uh, corruption estimate uh, in some newspaper. As far as I remember, they said that uh, the, we, the, 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 the largest number of traders who complained that they had to pay some bribe in order to get the trade license from the municipalities were women. Now think of a country or a society where there are fewer women in trade and the largest number of those who say that they have been subjected to paying bribe are women. There is something, uh, something difficult that needs to be, to be uh, explained there. It's rhetoric versus reality of sport. I guess uh, there is a point in it that uh, uh, since uh, 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 since uh, uh, there is some prejudice against uh, depending on external advice and policy, uh, if the economy has been opened up, uh, whatever limited scope it is, uh, we stick to the rhetoric. But I guess if you look at it, you'll find that, as I said, in the 1980s, a lot of reforms were undertaken, which together released the energy of the private enterprises. So the private enterprises came and they struggled in the context of the restrictions of the regulations which have been continuing from the past. So there was a time of mismatch between what the entrepreneurs wanted to do and what the regulation would allow them to do. So through that struggle have emerged a situation where the entrepreneurs can get along, what I mean, get along in their course of entrepreneurial activities and the government some or other becomes responsive. I would suggest that instead of saying that is by deal, we should rather say that the government policies and attitudes have been responsive. Now, if we feel that our study and analysis of growth development versus corruption says that corruption does constrain growth. Now, if growth happens, shall we say that the corruption perception that we have is not telling the reality, the reality may be something different. I will not go to the extent of saying that this is all unreliable, only to the extent of saying that we have to take this data and this interpretation with a little bit of caution. Um, no. uh, sorry, Dr. Rachman, because I know that um, Professor Besley 
is going to have to leave us at around midday, uh, around, well, in about uh, 20 so minutes. minutes. How many minutes you give me? Okay, um, I, will come back. I will come back later on. Uh, yes, I, I wanted to give an opportunity for uh, both our panelists to um, respond very briefly because we've got a number of questions from the floor. Um, I, perhaps just, just a couple of minutes of response, uh, particularly from Professor Besley um, uh, to start with. Uh, would you like to say a couple of words? Zahid, Zahid you have to unmute. Zahid? Yeah, I can unmute now. Okay, thank you very much, Pauline. I, I'm not going to say too much, but I think I want to draw out something I've, I've heard and relate it to, to what I said, which is um, I, I feel both um, inspired and concerned when people talk about a new model of development. Um, we, we do have one example that is held up as a different model that uh, many, many ways doesn't fit into our conventional view about what drives development. That's, of course, China. I think China is less of a paradox. I could give a talk on why China is not a paradox. Um, that's a, that's another talk, but it would follow very much along the lines of what Shanta is saying, pointing out the, 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 the systemic features that mean China isn't so different really in many ways compared to, to other countries that have achieved spectacular development. But the point I really wanted to make and, and, and to raise as a concern, and, and, and I think goes speaks directly to that, um, is how do the sort of accountability challenge? At the end of the day, um, institutions have to have to find a way of becoming accountable, whether they be NGOs or government institutions. And I do think we've learned, um, in some ways, to our cost. When that accountability breaks down, we get into trouble. And I, I think the challenge um, of creating a, a a different model of development is how you can do that. That. Most societies in the world have decided that um, the main form of accountability comes via government, particularly for spending public revenues. And when we outsource that challenge, that task to a wide range of institutions that are not accountable in a conventional way, then I think we 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 want to raise the question: Well, how are we how are we how are we going to achieve that? And and centrality of tax revenues is that through history, they have become the core element of accountability. If people are taking your money and spending it on your behalf, you sure want to know that they are spending it wisely. And so when countries have low tax takes in GDP, it's very often a symptom, not a necessary symptom, of low levels of accountability because citizens simply don't trust the government to be spending large amounts of their money given the system. So I raise that as a kind of question, not as a uh, to, to, to the idea that we have this new and different model. But that's something I'm going to take away from the session myself and do more thinking on uh, afterwards. So I've certainly learned something today, the possibility we should think of the Bangladesh case as a, as a kind of alternative model. Um, well, thank you, Tim. Um, Shanta, before I get to you and also to Dr. Rahman, I thought I'd throw into the mix one of the questions that come up, which is relevant to this discussion. So we have a question from Oren Hassan, who says, should Bangladesh continue in this manner or try to follow the developmental states like South Korea? I'm aware that Malaysia and Thailand tried to follow the developmental state model, but had limited success. So that sort of feeds in a little bit to what um, what this discussion is all about. Would you like to say a few words, uh, Shanta? Maybe then Dr. Rachman can also respond. Sure. Well, thanks very much. This is really a in very interesting discussion. Um, I, actually, I want to say one thing that you said, Pauline, after I spoke, which I want to clarify. I was not saying small government is better. Not at all, right? Um, and I'll come back to, to Tim's point in a minute. It, what I'm saying is that the way Bangladesh, Bangladeshis go about development is they take whatever government they have as given and figure out how can you maximize development given, given the, what the gov what government is doing. If we can get that government to do better, by all means, let's do it. Um, so I, I, I just want to make sure I'm not. This is not a, a plea for small government. Uh, this is not the, <laughs> the the Republican platform in the United States. This is actually saying let's be realistic. 
Uh, and I think the Bangladeshis are absolutely realistic, and they've they've managed to 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 work with work with what you uh, uh, what you have. Now that said, I think, uh, and and I think what uh, the Mashur Rahman was saying is actually, you know, very complementary to what I'm saying. It's not there's no contradiction there, and and I I I think we both uh, uh, agree that th the ways in which the government has when the government has manage to do some good is usually by relaxing some constraint. The, the examples of regulation that he was giving earlier uh, or the bonded warehouses was where the government relaxed something and allowed the private sector to, to flourish. And that is that complementarity that we would like to see uh, more of. Now, I think Tim's point is, uh, Tim's last point is exactly right. And I, I wanna emphasize that I, and this comes to the question of the how many BRAC schools are there in France, which is, I don't know whether this system is actually sustainable in the long run. For the very point that, that Tim made, which is we haven't put in place a system of accountability for all of these non-state providers to be, ac to, to be accountable. So I think it's absolutely uh, right that we have to start thinking about how how the system is going to evolve in the future, where the, the principle has to be, it's not that we need, we need more industrial policy or the developmental state. I, I would say, you know, since Bangladesh has not followed the developmental state and done very well, uh, it, it, it's, it's definitely dangerous to say, okay, now let's create a developmental state because we, that's how we would do even better. Uh, that, that, that's the lesson we need to take away. But at the same time, we need to start thinking about how we're gonna make these schools and uh, health providers uh, accountable in the, uh, in the long run, because that is how the state is going to evolve, uh, how the country is going to evolve uh, uh, to become a high, high, uh, high, uh, high income uh, country. And just one last point about the tax to GDP ratio. It is what, what Tim was saying, which is, I think one reason the tax to GDP ratio is low is because people don't trust the government to actually deliver on public expenditures. And in some sense, they're right. That it hasn't delivered on public expenditures. There's, there is still a lot of corruption. By the way, the, the corruption index, of course it has imperfections, but I, there are a host of indicators that show that there's high corruption in Bangladesh. It's not just the Transparency International Index. And even if, there, if you want to ignore all the indicators, just ask the people of Bangladesh. I mean, if every conversation, every article in the newspaper is about the corruption uh, in the country. So we know, we know what, what we're talking about there. Thanks. Um, okay, uh, before we go on to Dr. Uh, Rahman, perhaps uh, I, there's just another comment really that's come in from Akhtar Ma, uh, Mahud who says, does the panel agree that one aspect of government capacity is, all to, is also to understand that your capacity is low and act accordingly? In Bangladesh, the government seems to be aware of its limitations. And this is reflected in two things. A, it has given space to others to do things that it could not do. B, adopting an incremental experimental way where it adapts according to market response. In other words, if your capacity is low, you know, then you limit what the government um, actually tries to do. And uh, you know, maybe this has been a very sensible way that Bangladesh has proceeded and why it has been um, successful. I wonder if Dr. Uh, Rahman might be able to respond to that. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> I guess uh, there's a question which is difficult to answer. Uh, it is difficult to answer. It's like uh, asking someone, uh, do you beat uh, your daughter or your son uh, before they go to bed? Uh, if you say, no, I don't, that's a confession. If you say, yes, both are a confession. Now, uh, it's very difficult to get an explicit statement from government functionaries that they are incapable of doing certain things. On the other hand, uh, you will find that uh, the people who are not associated with the government in the private sector doing business, et cetera, they 
set very highly ambitious targets of their business performance. And they may not have enough uh, uh, resources, enough capital to invest. They may not have enough managerial competence. They do not have technical competence, but they would say that they can do it. And I mean, they have found out some, some, someone who would join him in, in, in doing the investment. Now, uh, the government does examine the probability that certain decisions can be implemented and certain decisions will face problem in implementation and some certain decisions, certain ambitions are beyond the capacity to implement. To the extent that the government screens out some of these possibilities, I would think that the government do recognize the limitation. And uh, having recognized the limitation, government undertakes programs which are within its capacity to implement. As I said earlier in explaining that a low tax GDP ratio is balanced by a low expenditure, public expenditure performance. So that kind of sets a low level equilibrium, not very desirable, but it maintains the balance. And as uh, uh, Shanta Devrajan pointed out, uh, the macroeconomic impact that macroeconomy is, is held in stability. So that's a kind of equilibrium that is there. Uh, but having said that, I would repeat that the government cannot be expected to admit uh, uh, explicitly that it recognizes the limitation and therefore does not undertake certain things. Okay, thank you. I, I have another question from the floor, which Sorry, is- Pauline, can, yes. can I possibly just come back very briefly? Yes briefly on this point, because I think it's a very important discussion around, around this. Mm. And I, just an example, actually, an example from the UK, not from Bangladesh, but mm -hmm. Britain for a long time had a very complex industrial strategy, um, which was a complete failure. And that resulted in the end of the government, particularly under the government of Margaret Thatcher in the 1980s, just deciding it didn't want to do industrial strategy. Now, of course, the alternative would have been to say, we need to build government capacity to do it better but the decision was made that there should be no industrial strategy. Now that's changing now, but that's an example of where the government concluded for whatever reasons, it just wasn't very good at doing a certain kind of policy and therefore tried to close down that branch. Policy. So I think it's a very important public debate to try and establish the areas in which either you can invest in government competence to improve it, or you simply want the government to get away from that area because they're not very good at doing things. And it can be a very painful debate we're drawing all the public subsidies from the industries that have been supported by the industrial strategy resulted in unemployment and all sorts of issues. But, but, but all the same, I think this is a key element of what, what should be part of the development dialogue. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to bring in another question on a slightly different angle to all this. Um, this is from Sabik Jawad, who asks, um, he says, um, I have a query regarding the relationship between economic and political liberalization. It seems that there was an expectation in the past that as countries opened up their economies, uh, opened up their economies and initiated market reforms, they would democratize as well with South Korea and Taiwan often cited as an example of countries which became prosperous liberal democracies whilst also growing economically greatly. However, this assumption seems to be challenged by China, where opening up hasn't led to significant democratic reforms, and Bangladesh seems to be following a China model of authoritarian capitalism. So is there indeed a relationship between economic and political liberalization, or was this a false assumption in the first place? What differentiates China and Bangladesh's political economy from countries which have democratized like Taiwan and South Korea? And should we be concerned by the rise of authoritarian capitalism and Bangladesh supposedly following the so-called China model. This is not a small question, but um, I wonder if you could each perhaps give uh, a, a brief response, if at all if possible, to this uh, particular question, which I think uh, concerns quite a lot of our audience. Uh, maybe, uh, should we start with, with Tim again? Yeah, what a fantastic question, and I and obviously not one I can tackle in any uh, convincing way in a short response. 
I'll say one thing, and it comes back to, to something I, I said earlier about how we understand what went on in, in China. I, I would argue that for in, in, in certain dimensions, not all dimensions, China built an effectively accountable state. So China did something rather clever, which was the, its decentralization program that allowed state govern, uh, governors of provinces almost to compete with each other to provide economic growth within their province. And then their, their career prospects sort of hinged on, and there's evidence of this, they got promoted if they generated economic growth within their provinces. And it created, even though the system was not democratic in any conventional sense, it created a system of accountability for delivering growth to citizens. And that system in many ways, not just for, for growth, but for other aspects of what the state did, served as something of a mechanism for disciplining poor quality public officials and promoting good quality public officials. And so even, so we, of course it was an authoritarian state by some narrow definition. There were no free and fair elections or competitive elections or any of the things we associate with that. But one should look beyond that and think about what the accountability structures are. And that's why I sort of framed the, the question to Chandra in the way I did. That there is a concern that some of that, because it's not built in to a formal constitutional structure can be quite fragile. And, you're, and the question is completely right. A decision was made at points in, say, the, the history of South Korea and, or other countries to make a more explicit transition to a more conventional model of accountability, basically based on citizens um, having the right to choose the people who they're uh, governed by. But, um, but I think, it, 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 of course, it's authoritarian. But one, as I say, one has to think behind the system and I do think there are worrying, to be honest with you, there are worrying trends in China right now, which perhaps are movements away that could in the end um, lead to some damaging uh, consequences for this system of accountability that's been in place. But I, I, that would be the way I would suggest we think about this. And so we, we go back and we ask about that. What, what makes things accountable? Uh, thank you. Um, Shanta, do you, can you respond briefly? Uh, yeah, I fully agree with what Tim just said. And I would go look at it the other side, which is that just because you have a, a, a democratic elections or competitive elections doesn't mean you have that accountability either. Uh, and that can break down quite easily. And I've seen that in, including in Sri Lanka. Uh, but you know, there, there's a big debate going on now in the United States. Is the United States about to become uh, a, a Fragile state, uh, the, the, and uh, you know there are books being written and and uh, and things like that. So here you've got a two two hundred fifty year old constitution and sets of checks and balances in a system that is also not guaranteed to provide the kind of accountability that we need for for development. Um, okay, thank you. Um, so, Dr. Rahman, I. Um, uh, you know, it, it would be good to get your response briefly, but I also have another question thrown in because it's specifically directed to you from uh, somebody in our audience uh, called Rahat Rahman, who says, uh, does the government of Bangladesh have any plan to strengthen the economic diplomacy of Bangladesh, especially in the case of technological infrastructure? Bangladesh is still dependent on imports. What are the plans to move forward? So I wonder if you could just briefly talk about the previous question and then um, if you have, uh, if we have time, quickly answer the specific question um, from yeah, I... Rahat Rahman. Yes, go ahead. I guess I, I would agree with uh, uh, Sir Tim Bisley and, and Shanta Devrajan on uh, the general question of uh, the model. Uh, now, before Taiwan made it, where was the Taiwan model? Before Korea made it, where was the Korean model? And Korea in between had a very classical pattern of authoritarianism, military dictatorship and so on. So I would not say that uh, these are the only models which need to be imitated and Bangladesh also can show a different path of development, a different path of growth. Uh, the economic and political liberalization, I guess theoretically there is always a connection between that if an economy grows and people are prosperous, et cetera, they start talking about freedom and, and, and so on. Uh, but the fact remains that a state has to perform certain tasks 
and exercise its power in order to achieve those goals. When the state or the society tends towards fragility, it is for the state to assert the kind of order that, would, that makes it possible to move ahead. So I guess we should not make a sharp distinction between authoritarianism, dictatorship, a failed state and so on until the state fails. Economic diplomacy has been a bit confusing to me all along. Uh, diplomacy refers to the kind of political and security related relationship between states. Economic diplomacy relates to the economic relations that a state would have with uh, other outsiders outside the state, like the Bangladesh would have some I believe there may have been a technical issue on uh, Dr. Moshiram Mansur's end. Uh, I think we're actually going to be drawing to a close soon. So um, we did want to get, uh, you know, we have many questions. From uh, oh, the, the, okay. the, the power, power focused uh, uh, diplomatic relationship. Um, uh, well, uh, Dr. Rachman, I, I hope you can hear me. Um, I think that uh, we uh, uh, so we need to sort of bring all this to a close. Unfortunately, we've got many more questions, but not enough time. Uh, but I was wondering if we could, uh, if Dr. Rachman, perhaps you can wrap up. Uh, you know, sort of final conclusion that you have um, about the discussion today, and maybe we can pass it on to uh, Professor Besley and then to Dr. Devarajan um, before we uh, close the, the the whole session. Dr. Rahman. Oh, thank you. Uh, I would be very brief and, and would point to a few things only. One is uh, there are short term fluctuations in the country's administration, in the country's economy. But there's also a long term and broad trend towards something. We should look at the broad long term trends and see whether the foundations for achieving those long-term goals had been set up. As I look at Bangladesh, it seems to me that we do go through these short-term fluctuations, excitements, and so on. But as far as the broad and long-term goals and trends are concerned, we have consistently uh, followed that. Secondly, over the time, there has been a move towards progressive liberalization and progressive space for uh, progressively larger space for the private entrepreneurs and the private sectors. Uh, I would repeat only what I had said, that there is a time that we go through a mismatch between what uh, the people want to do and what the regulations would require them to do. That mismatch is resolved over time. And if the mismatch continues for too long, then that restrains the growth impetus that there may be. Uh, I would finally say that uh, Bangladesh is a much misunderstood country. It is misunderstood in the sense that its achievements are suspected that maybe it is not there. Uh, but if we, can, if we can dismiss that kind of prejudice, we'll find that it is a, uh, it's a country which has been progressing in a sustained manner and also extending the benefits of, 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 of growth to a much larger group of people. <clears throat> there, was a, there were one or two questions was directed to me. One is the reform capacity. I think that our history does show that Bangladesh can uh, uh, effect the reforms which are necessary in order to enhance the capacity. But it's not something that it doesn't, it is not there today and it will be, it will happen tomorrow. It does take time. 
for moving from one cultural social context to another social cultural context of economic uh, economic activities. The other was uh, democracy. Uh, I guess I, 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 I feel the same way as uh, uh, Shanta Devarajan feels that democracy has a normative meaning, but it also has a practical meaning. The normative conception does not accept that there would be any limitations of what we think there should be democracy. But in practice, there are people, their interests, their attitudes, their, their cultural values and so on. So a democratic government has to deal with the multidimensional aspirations, expectations and, and limitations. Given all that, I would say that in broad terms, Bangladesh has been moving in the right direction of expanding economic opportunities, enhancing growth, and also distributing the benefits of growth equitably. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, could I ask Tim uh, Besley, Professor Besley, sorry, to... Uh, yeah, yeah, so ju ju just picking up on that, I mean, I think um, the starting point is clearly one in which Bangladesh has um, um, has impressed uh, the world with many of the decisions it's made and the way it's achieved that. So, so for those of us who are, who are, I suppose, of a more academic mindset, the question for us is to is to think about what lessons we can draw that perhaps are of relevance beyond. And I mean, Bangladesh, for one of the things we haven't talked about, of course, has spawned a multinational NGO in the form of BRAC. So BRAC has been very active in Africa, promoting many of the same ideas that it promotes in in Bangladesh. So, so clearly, um, already the model in many ways is traveling. Um, and But the, the question all the time is, uh, and this is what makes doing research and policy so hard, is what's the counterfactual? What might have been done differently and what might have been the consequences of decisions that were not taken or could have been taken in a different way? And that's a very challenging and difficult uh, um, uh, thing to do. Um, so the thing I'm going to take away from today myself, and perhaps uh, I'd be, be uh, willing and, and keen to engage more with the forum on this, is kind of what is the Bangladesh model and to what extent is it really an exceptional and uh, model and a different model that other countries could consider borrowing elements from? I think that's a very interesting question, not just from an academic perspective, but I think also from a policy perspective, because when we were doing uh, our, our work on the Commission for Fragile States a few years ago, there was lots of debate and discussion around, well, what are the models that not just fragile states, but states with the aspiration to develop in general should be using? And there was, a, of course, been a lot of talk about China and the East Asian model. And a, a lot of people look at that model and they wonder, well, is it even feasible to follow that model? If you look at the, the history of the Chinese state that gave it a certain kind of capacity to even pursue that model, it's not the starting point that many countries begin. So it's even fanciful to think many countries could uh, replicate, even if they chose to try and replicate that, that kind of model. So the question is, given the starting point, what are the lessons that can really be learned from different approaches? And, uh, and, and I think that's the part that, that we, we can draw out. And then there's the question within that, for Bangladesh, and which I unfortunately don't feel very competent to offer advice on, is then how do you make that model work even better? What are the key blockages and difficulties that are not being addressed at the moment? And what, is, what are the systemic changes? And what are the risks associated with those? I mean, we have seen throughout history failed institutional transplants uh, more often than we've seen successful ones. So saying, well, we're going to move in the direction of another country because we like the way their institutional framework has worked is no recipe to success in general. It can help un un under some conditions, but it's really very difficult to think of ourselves as, as peddling in well understood recipes for change. Um, thank you very much. Um, so Dr. Devarajan, a final word? Okay, I'll be very brief because I know Tim has to leave as well. Uh, let me just say the one thing I would like to uh, take away because I think it adds to whatever I said and what I learned today is it comes from my good friend Akhtar Mahmoud's question about incremental change and knowing your limitations. Uh, now he put it in terms of the government, uh, but I think this applies to all of Bangladesh. 
that the way the private sector operates as well as the, the, the way the government operates, because it's the same people anyway, um, is one of incrementalism making small changes, see if they work. If they work, let's go further. If they don't work, we can try something else. And at the same time, even if your rhetoric is high ambition and, and uh, lots of great things, know your limitations and know that you may not be able to achieve that uh, if you just go for that without uh, making the incremental changes. So I think this is really a very exciting agenda and maybe I, I, I too, like Tim, would like to would be happy to engage with the forum uh, in seeing how we can make that uh, work uh, for the future of Bangladesh. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed to all the panel. Um, this has been a really interesting and stimulating discussion. And also thank you to our young audience for their attention and their engagement. Um, and I'm so sorry that we haven't had time to um, uh, ask more questions. Um, I also, before I go, I'd, I'd really like to thank um, Abia Hassan, who has been the inspiration behind the series and who has worked tirelessly to make today's discussion possible. Um, and he is, as everyone knows, the founder of the, um, uh, of, of the forum and uh, has been behind many of the initiatives of the forum, which has been hugely successful. Um, so now I'd like to finally hand over to Dr. Akhtar Mahmoud, who's chairman of the Youth Policy Forum Advisory Panel for a final word. Uh, Dr. Mahmoud. Thank you very much, Pauline. Uh, this has been a fascinating discussion. Uh, I've been associated with the Youth Policy Forum for for almost the last three years, almost since the time it started. And it's really amazing to see the way the forum has evolved. And of course, Abir has played a leading role in this, but he has been accompanied by dozens, and now it's becoming almost hundreds of, and thousands perhaps, of young people, mm -hmm. young Bangladeshis and their friends abroad, uh, who, are, who, are, who have taken a very serious interest in understanding policy not just the policy issues, but how policy is formulated. And uh, we often say that the youth are the future of our country. In some ways, the forum is proving that they're even the present because they're not just trying to learn about policy in their limited way, they're even trying to start uh, influencing it in some ways. So for example, there's a very exciting program of the forum where they're engaging with half a dozen members of parliament um, uh, helping the parliamentarians with some research, but in the process also trying to influence their thinking. And they've also mobilized about 100 professionals across various fields, and they engage with them. So I just wanted to say that for the young people who are devoting so much of their time, and all of this is voluntary, uh, it's, it's a tremendous encouragement to see the three of you, luminaries in your own field, very, very busy people, uh, spending more than an hour and a half um, uh, talking to them. So that's that's great encouragement uh, for the members of the Youth Policy Forum. And I'd like to thank you for that. And for the members of the forum, I think you've got a lot of food for thought. I think there's a big research agenda that has been uh, presented in front of you, which is trying to understand um, how the government and other actors in Bangladesh have operated in the past. Are uh, there lessons for the world to learn from that? but also for us as we forge our future. That's the name of this series. And uh, I think we could not have asked for a better start to this series on forging our future. And Pauline, thanks very much for arranging this and for <laughs> moderating this so well. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Um, right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your presence. Thank you, uh, uh, Professor Besley and Shanta.